Not that every time I'll meet you, I'm going to be talking about my mother's passing, but while it's, <laughs> while it's fresh, I think it's interesting because I think this is something we don't talk about enough. I met many of you the couple of days after she had passed and I was feeling very open and it's a lot of energy, I think, to, to be there with someone in this transition that was definitely this kind of expanded and exalted state I could experience. And then, as we all can see, and this is why I want to share it, because I think it's hopefully helpful for us to, to see this, then like, like a pond that was totally clear, clear reflection, and then slowly the moss starts to come and cover the pond and I'm watching in these days when you're dealing with all the stuff, what to do with the clothes, what to do with all the things. And here I am, I'm putting clothes into garbage bags, you know, and you're thinking, what was our life just to put in a garbage bag at the end of the day? You know, it's a, it's a very interesting process. What I'm noticing is the thinking mechanism that comes in when you're, when you're dealing with stuff when you're in contact with form, when you have to function and bring the attention to things, to forms, to who's getting what, who does what, what do I want, what do they want, and all these details, it brings the attention into the small, into the relative. What is relative? In this exalted state, this exalted, blown open state, when you're sitting with someone and something is transmitted at that time, it's, it's beyond the mind. It's beyond our comprehension. And something gets totally open. I think it's really helpful to see this seemingly polar opposite energy. One is totally with the big. <laughs> you're just open to totally formless, beyond any comprehension, beyond any way of putting it even into words, as opposed to mm -hmm. the energy that is dealing very much with things and bringing in the comprehension, the relative, so the formless from the form. And these two energies, what I'm watching, when the energy goes into the form, it invites opposition. It invites doubt because as soon as you have to make a decision, you have now right and wrong, me and them, us and you. You have all the divisions coming with what you do with form because form is in the realm of division. So now watching my mother passing and just feeling this inexplicable sense of perfection even at a time when your mother is passing and you, how can you say it's, it's perfect? It was brilliant. It was divine brilliance and feeling this kind of exalted state, which I don't think people who have access to understanding formless can really grasp or understand. Now, two weeks later, watching what is happening, that pond is now very much rippling with energy on, on form on things, on people, and ultimately on division. So now there's clashing waves. Now, obviously, one feels much more comfortable, especially us who are meditators, in the formless, and we're excited about that, and we're interested to explore that, and we want more of that, mm -hmm. as opposed to really with the attention so much on all the details in the form. But what I'm really seeing is that even though all the doubt that comes, I'm watching something coming. Now, what we observe with thinking is that it comes uninvited. And I think this is a very important thing. I'm not entertaining it. I'm watching it coming uninvited. And there is a difference. There is a big difference. And I think this is what can really help us in our own lives in all kinds of ways. When certain thoughts come that are of division, because your energy is involved with form, I should have done that, I shouldn't have done this, 
And now this doubt, I can't remove it yet. It keeps coming, uninvited, uninvited. So we all experience this in all kinds of ways, with all kinds of circumstances. We experience doubt. We don't need to entertain it. That's the thing. In the Vedic tradition, there is a word. It appears to be two words. Neti neti. N-E-T-H-I. N-E-T-H-I. Neti neti. Translated simply as not this, not this. So now I'm watching the doubt. Watching is the key word. I'm watching the doubt like ripples on a, on a lake disturbing the clarity of the clear pool. The empowering knowledge is, I know that this, what appears to be disturbing the stillness, is not. To know what is not is a powerful knowledge, more powerful in one way to know what is. Because although we can all have moments of being very open and understanding the truth, something deeper than just this mundane form relative experience. It is not always the case that this remains open because so long as we have bodies, we have to function with them and we have to deal with relative things. So the really empowering knowledge I'm finding is to know what is not. I know it's not true what my doubts that appear to come in my mind and disturb the clarity are not true. And we have to, with vengeance, really bring the energy to know this. And this is what is our sadhana. Now you can have these big revelations that all is eternal and all is perfection, all is peace, all is freedom. They are openings of revelation when the lake is totally calm. But so long as we have these bodies, we will experience all kinds of, of weather situations. And it's completely unhelpful, I find, at this stage of my discovery. I find it unhelpful to think that only when there is a revelation do I know something. Only when there's revelation I can say, it's okay. It's all good. No, we have to know something which is throughout. What remains throughout the experiences? Because the experience is open. All the experiences doubtful are still of the changing experiences. So what is truly empowering? What is the true revelation? Is neither the open, total open clear lake, pure vision, and also not the wavering, conflicting, doubtful mind. Something is there, which is neither. It's not this, not this. And I'm finding it now really helpful to know what is not. Nisargadatta, some of you may know this great enlightened being that was from he died many years ago. His disciples wrote a book called I Am That. And if you haven't got it in your library, I suggest you get it. It's one of my favorites. Nisargadatta Maharaj is his name. The book is I Am That. You can Google it easily, I Am That. Someone asked him, can you tell us about your enlightenment and the journey towards your enlightenment? And this is often how the mind understands things in terms of there being a process. What was the process of your freedom? How did your freedom come about? How did it happen? Because we're so focused on happenings, the big happenings, the mundane happenings, the liking happenings, the not liking happenings, the happenings we want more of, the happenings we want to push away. We are focused on happenings to dictate our level of peace and freedom within. And this is so unhelpful. So someone had asked him that, can you tell us the journey of your self-realization? And he said, 
It was never a journey. I just ceased being deceived. And maybe, Freddie, where are you? If you could just translate that one part. The, the, the sage um, a été interviewé et on lui a posé la question quel était le voyage, la route pour votre jusqu'à votre um, éveil, votre illumin, enlightenment. Et il a dit ce n'était pas un voyage. J'ai juste cessé d'être d'être dans l'illusion. I ceased being deceived. So now we have to look, what is the deception? This is now the next question, right? Quelle est la, donc, quelle est la, quelle est l'illusion, quelle est la déception? What is the deception? So then he says, I used to think I knew so many things. Je pensais, il a dit, je pensais que je savais tellement de choses. Avant. And then, and then I discovered I knew nothing. J'ai découvert qu'en fait, je ne savais rien. But then I realized, and that's a different word from thinking. I thought I knew yeah. something. I then thought I didn't know anything. And then I realized in knowing nothing, I lost nothing. Et je me suis rendu compte qu'en qu ne sachant rien, je ne perdais rien. So what is the deception? That I gain something and I lose something. Alors quelle est l'illusion? C'est qu'on gagne quelque chose et qu'on perd quelque chose. So in this case, what I'm experiencing, when my mother passed, I gained some kind of vision of perfection. Alors, mon illusion quand ma mère est décédée, c'est que j'ai gagné une sens, un sens de perfection. And now all the details and all the stuff is happening and my head is exploding with all of this. And now I lost it. This could appear to be true. I lost it now because now I'm with the et doubt and with the, all the stuff. Yeah. Et maintenant que je dois m'occuper de toutes les choses de la vie, du tri, de ses affaires et tout ça, que mon mental est agité, je peux sentir que j'ai perdu cette, ce moment de perfection. So now, can we see and translate this, not just about my mother's passing, it's not, it's about everything that we think. Can we look now? What is that thread, when I say again and again, ever-present, self, you, is ever-present, can we now catch the thread? What does not change? Donc maintenant, est-ce qu'on peut regarder le, le fil? Quel est le fil? Qu'est-ce qui, qu est qui est inaltérable? Qu'est-ce qui ne change jamais? So lastly, just to say, I'm watching the waves. It's not comfortable, but I know, and this is the knowledge that is so powerful, I know something has not been lost because I don't rely on a feeling or an experience to verify my knowledge. Alors, je regarde les vagues et je me dis que, que je, que je me suis rendu compte que je n'ai pas, ce n'est pas, un sentiment auquel je m'accroche, que je n'ai rien perdu. So let's take a little time in meditation just to let this be absorbed. I hope I've been able to convey. We'll take 15 minutes in meditation and then I invite you all or anyone who feels inspired to share what they discovered in this time of meditation to then express it in your own words. <laughs> 